Hi, let's talk about the osteology of the oral cavity. Before we move to the skull, we should begin with the hyoid bone. The hyoid bone has a couple of main features. So there are the greater horns or the greater cornua, the lesser horns, and then the, uh, the body or the corpus of the hyoid bones. It's these greater cornua that we're concerned about with respect to the oral cavity because they're going to be the attachment site for the hyoglossus muscle. One on either side, going up from the hyoid bone into the tongue. So it's one of the extrinsic sets of tongue muscles. Now moving into the skull, uh, specifically the mandible of the skull, and this is a posterior view of the mandible. We can see here's the body of the mandible, and there are the rami of the mandible. Here are the mandibular teeth uh, and the angles of the mandible. So here is the, uh, the mental or the uh, posterior view of the, the chin region. So let's... Let's see what uh, what there is to uh, to behold here. So, looking specifically at the posterior aspect of the uh, the mental region, we can see two pairs of spines. So, these are called mental spines, and there's a superior pair. These are going to be much more evident, and then an inferior pair. These are going to be much less evident. The, uh, the superior pair here are the attachment sites for the genioglossus muscle. Whereas the inferior pair are the attachment sites for the geniohyoid muscles. So genioglossus is another pair of extrinsic tongue muscles running from the uh, the genu, the bend of the, the mandible, um, to the tongue. And then the geniohyoid runs from the genu of the mandible to the hyoid bone. So these are exquisitely well-named uh, muscles. There's, there's, a lot, um, there's a lot in a muscle's name. Um, now we have a couple of uh, fossae or uh, indentations within the bone. So anteriorly here, we have the digastric fossae. These digastric fossae are the anterior attachment sites for the anterior bellies of the digastric muscles. So digastric fossae for the anterior bellies of the digastric muscles. That, that kind of makes sense. And when we think about the uh, the osteology in this in this region, so we, we have these layers here. So genioglossus, geniohyoid, and then anterior belly of digastricus, um, and then we're going to have another set of muscles, the mylohyoid muscles, and those are going to uh, attach to the mylohyoid lines here and there. And then they'll meet their counterpart along the, uh, the midline of the, of the floor of the oral cavity in a rafe. So we have this, this layering of genioglossus, geniohyoid, mylohyoid, and then anterior belly of the digastricus, which we should, uh, we should see this uh, borne out in uh, the muscles as well. So superior to the uh, mylohyoid line, we're going to have a fossa, and these fossae are going to um, accommodate the, uh, the sublingual glands. These are the sublingual 
fossae. And then inferior to that mylohyoid line, we're going to have an indentation that's going to uh, accommodate the deep parts of the submandibular glands, and these are the submandibular fossae. So all, uh, all is fairly straightforward here in terms of the, uh, the anatomical arrangements of these fossae and spines and uh, lines with respect to the orientation of their muscles. Now let's take a, uh, a lateral view of the mandible, uh, recalling that uh, the main parts of the mandible are the body, which we can see here, and then the ramus of the mandible. My apologies for any squealing of this pen. Um, within the body of the, the mandible, the, uh, the portion of the body that is going to support the teeth, this is the alveolar arch. There's also an alveolar arch on the maxilla as well to support the maxillary teeth. Um, and this, this lateral aspect of the alveolar arch here is known as the buccal plate. And that buccal plate is uh, very uh, delicate compared to the lingual plate. So the lingual plate would be on the tongue side or the lingual side of the mandible. And so as you're performing your extractions, as you leverage, um, the, the buccal plate is in danger of, of fracturing. The lingual plate tends to be much more robust um, and is unlikely to fracture during an extraction, but that, uh, that buccal plate may. So that buccal plate is not to be confused with the buccal shelf, which we can see here as this indentation. So there's a, just a flattened ridge there. That buccal shelf, if you can imagine um, the long buccal nerve, or the buccal nerve, sometimes called the long buccal nerve, which is a branch of V3 on its way out uh, from the infratemporal fossa to the, uh, the buccal fascial space um, is, is moving along that line. So that's a good landmark for finding that, uh, that long buccal uh, nerve. So that, that's palpatable. Um, we also have the uh, mylohyoid groove of the ramus. So this is a, a medial view of, of the mandible. Um, so again, this would be the, the ramus. And coming down here is this mylohyoid groove. The mylohyoid groove uh, is a groove which accommodates the nerve to the mylohyoid muscle. So here's the mylohyoid line coming down here. Here is where the inferior alveolar nerve, the IAN, enters into the mandible, but then it gives off that nerve to the mylohyoid muscle there. And that mylohyoid groove accommodates that nerve. Finally, let's talk a little bit about um, teeth. Uh, there are teeth of the maxilla and teeth of the mandible. Uh, adult humans uh, typically have 32 teeth, and the numbering convention, you know, we would start with number one at, for the, the right third maxillary molar, and we would come all the way over to 16, which would be the left third maxillary molar, and then we go down to 17, that'd be the left third mandibular molar, and then over to 32, which would be the right third mandibular molar. But we also give these teeth names. Um, and so when we name these teeth and divide them up, we usually do so by quadrant. So if we were to just draw a line down the middle, we would see that we have in each quadrant, a central incisor, a lateral incisor, a canine, a first premolar, a second premolar, and then first, second, and third 
molars, which we can't see owing to the, uh, the anterior view of this uh, particular skull. Uh, humans, by virtue of how they've evolved, uh, generally um, are going to not necessarily have space to accommodate their, uh, their third molars. Um, these tend to erupt later in life, uh, towards the end of teens, early 20s, uh, so we call them wisdom teeth. And what uh, that age has to do with wisdom, I'll never know. Um, but uh, it, it certainly didn't arrive uh, for me at that age. So let's look at the, uh, at the mandible here. Um, so we've got a, a, a pretty good view of the, the mandibular teeth. So this would be tooth number 17. That would be a third molar. That would be a second molar. And that would be a first molar. So those are your mandibular molars. Here would be the second premolar and the first premolar. Here is the canine. And then for this, here are the incisors. That's the medial, and then that's the lateral, and then we can go from 17 all the way over here to 32. And we can see that uh, these teeth are in this alveolar arch, and the alveolar process of the arch surrounds the, the roots of the teeth. We also have a nice view here of the, uh, the buccal shelf as we go. So these are some of the, uh, the osteological features that, uh, that you'll encounter in the oral cavity. Thank you very much for your time.